Happy New Year, everybody. Now, there is a tradition on this channel that in the very first week of January, I react to space memes that you send me because let's face it, nobody has got enough energy in the first week of January to do anything else. So I asked you all on Instagram to share with me your favorite space memes and I had Sam go through them all and pick out a few so that I can blind react to them. We can all have a laugh and maybe learn something in the process too. So let's dive in and we'll start with the first one. <laughs> Be more like Pluto. Pluto doesn't give one. Now, admittedly, this is not a blind react. I did already see this when Kiana, aka the Astro Stud on Instagram, shared this because I got a notification, but it is brilliant. It's such a good meme. Like, it's just a really nice reminder that, yeah, Pluto is really weird, although probably a little bit exaggerated here. Sure, its orbit is not in that sort of same flat plane as the eight planets, but it's only tilted around about. 20 degrees or so. Let me just look that up. Pluto orbital tilt. 17 degrees. So yeah, I was right with around about 20. And also its orbit is not a perfect circle. So none of the objects in the solar system, the planets, the dwarf planets, none of them have perfect circular orbits. They're all slightly oval shaped, but Pluto's is really oval shaped to the point where like when it's closest to the sun, it's inside the orbit of Neptune around about 40 times the Earth's sun distance. But when it's furthest away from the sun in its orbit, it's actually like 50 times the Earth sun distance. So like an extra 10 Earth sun distances away, which again, is weird. Now the reason that most things in the solar system are all in that same flat plane, meaning that they all sort of roughly take the same path through the sky, is because all the stuff that originally formed the solar system was a big gas cloud that as it collapsed down it started to spin. And just like when you take a ball of pizza dough and throw it up above your head and it flattens out into a pizza, a flat disc, the stuff that originally formed the sun and the solar system it flattened out into a flat disk as well. And so as the planets and all of the other objects in the solar system formed, they all tended to form in that flat disk. So to get something as weird as Pluto's orbit, you need some external influence to pull on it and create some chaos. And at first people thought the chaos of Pluto's orbit was just because of the pull of Neptune, right? So it was the interaction of the sun, Neptune and Pluto, a classic three body problem. But very quickly people realised that to create the very unique sort of chaos of Pluto's orbit while also keeping it actually very stable in the fact that its orbit doesn't really change even though it's a very chaotic orbit, then you also need to include the influence of Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune on Pluto to, to get this sort of perfect storm. Essentially they're all in resonance with each other, it's what's known as a VZLK oscillation and a lot of the objects beyond the orbit of Neptune seem to have this resonance giving them these very chaotic orbits. Just one of the many other reasons why Pluto was downgraded from a planet to a dwarf planet. But again, you shouldn't be sad about that. Stop complaining about it on the internet. And just remember now it means that Pluto is king of the dwarves. All right, let's look at the next one, shall we? Oh yeah, Sam said one of these ones was a video. Scientists have managed to film how a black hole absorbs matter. Please tell me this is a cat. Please tell me this is a cat. Please be a cat. <laughs> it's a cat. <laughs> no, I'm gonna watch it again. And I, I so desperately wish this is actually how it happened. I think, you know, if I have my scientific brain turned on, then, you know, us scientists would never use the term absorbs matter. Like the correct scientific term for how a black hole grows is accretion. Like you say that a black hole accretes matter. And the way that actually works is that, okay, yeah, you've got material that's orbiting a black hole, again, in a flat disk because things as they spin, flatten out into disks. And then you've got all of these particles of matter that are sort of orbiting the black hole, but they're on stable orbits. They're not gonna actually, you know, fall towards the black hole and grow the black hole in mass. So what needs to happen is you need to have collisions between particles so that one of them can lose energy and one of them can gain energy. So just like when you have collisions between balls on a pool table. If you get the shot right, then the cue ball will completely stop losing all of its energy and transfer all of the energy to the ball that it's hit, which will then go careening off. Same thing happens around a black hole, right? You've got two particles in orbit around the black hole, happily orbiting it, not going anywhere, but if they collide, one of them can gain all the energy and go careening off. The other one loses all of its energy and then gets pulled in by the black hole's gravity and will eventually in spiral all the way down until it crosses the event horizon and then grows the mass of the black hole. That is accretion in action. If you think about it, like watching this video back is pretty accurate in terms of accretion. You have that initial collision there, right? That stops this particle or this 
paper ball in its tracks. I should totally try and do this with my cat Pip as well because she loves paper balls. And then, you know, we have the eventual in spiral <laughs> into the black hole. Just beautiful. Anyway, moving on from cats and black holes, two of my favourite topics. Next up, we have this. I finally found it after four months. The stage was T cycle three results, which were rejected. <laughs> Oh, this is so many astronomers' lives right now. If you're an observer anyway, like me, and you use telescopes, like you have to go through this process of applying for telescopes, so whether this is JWST or another telescope like Hubble or a telescope on the ground, you have to go through this process of, you know, applying to use that telescope to do the science that you want to do so that you can collect data to answer questions like, okay, you know, what's the atmosphere of this planet like? Or how fast is the universe expanding? Or how big is this black hole? First, you have to write a proposal explaining that science question and why it's important we answer this question with like JWST over any other science question, and then how you'd use JWST to do that. And then you submit that proposal and then you don't hear anything for months because it takes ages for the panel to go through all of the proposals and rank them based on scientific merit. So much so that you kind of forget that you've put in a proposal at all until randomly one day an email just appears in your inbox telling you if your proposal was accepted and you were successful or if it was rejected and you were unsuccessful. And odds are, most likely you were unsuccessful just because of how oversubscribed JWST actually is. So in the most recent cycle, cycle four, so it's fourth year of observations, it was nine times oversubscribed. So that means that us astronomers applied for nine times more hours than are physically available in a year to actually use JWST. And as Mari says here, right, this could easily apply to any other instrument as well. She mentions Muse on the VLT, which for those of you who've been following me for a while know that I keep writing proposals to try and get time to use Muse, but that instrument was 18 times oversubscribed in a recent cycle. It's even harder to get time on than JWST, which is just absolutely crazy. And we just basically have to keep on trucking. I've currently got two observing proposals to that I'm waiting to hear about whether they've been accepted or rejected and we just sit over here and just keep our fingers crossed. I now like really want to check my emails to see if I've heard about anything of certain proposals. Maybe I'll just do that quickly, quickly. No, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Occasionally you remember and you're like <gasps> And then you're like, no, it's fine. I've not heard anything yet. <laughs> and then there's like a rumor that goes around that it's like, <gasps> emails are starting coming through and everyone's like, Ugh. all right, next up. Astronomers be like, yeah, call it. Wait, 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 hang on. For the amount of times that I have to get these ridiculous names spot on in my videos, let's do this properly. <clears throat> let's see if I can do it in one take. <clears throat> call it. <laughs> Jhurgurgurg 4953-34Z8-4534-5934-8HGGHOGO HGGHO geo quite proud of myself for that. <laughs> That's why she's a pro, folks. <laughs> In all seriousness though, I get that some astronomy names just sound a little bit ridiculous to someone who's, you know, not in the field. Like, yes, okay, and really notable objects will get given like a, a proper name, like a colloquial name, but for everything else, we do have standards that we stick to. So if something's discovered, say, in a big survey of the sky, it might just be like a little fuzzy smudge or something, it's probably going to be named after the coordinates on the sky, like it's sort of sky, latitude and longitude that it's found, so that anybody else who wants to study it will know exactly where to look because you've already got the coordinates for it. So that's why you end up with names that are like J1234-3579 you know, or something. Or if it's found in a specific survey that's been done with JWST, then it's named after the survey. So you might have heard of a lot of galaxies recently that have been dubbed Jades after the Jades survey with JWST. So for example, the current most distant galaxy known is known as Jades-GS-Z14-Z. Zero. And there is some method to that madness. It's named Jades because it was discovered in the Jades survey. The G is because it's a galaxy. The S is because it's in the southern sky and not the northern sky. So again, that gives you some sort of like indication of where it is. And then the Z14 is all about what redshift factor it's at. So Z is the letter we use to represent redshift and 14 means it's past a redshift of 14 and it broke that 
record. So the redshift factor tells you how much the light has been stretched out by the expansion of the universe. So the bigger the number, the more stretch, and the longer the light has been traveling and the further away the galaxy is. And then you're probably wondering, well, what's the zero at the end mean? Because this galaxy actually has a redshift of 14.32. Well, the zero is just the fact that it was the first galaxy that was found beyond a redshift of 14. Yes, astronomers start numbering things at zero. We are programmers at heart. So I get it, astronomy names might sound crazy, but there is a system and we sort of stick to that system. It's a lot easier anyway than having just like a million proper names for everything and uh, trying to remember them all, which nobody can write. Space is hard enough without adding more words to remember. All right, next up. Was cool before it mattered, is that? that scientifically accurate? Like if anything, I feel like it should be was hot before it mattered, right? Like think of the Big Bang Theory soundtrack, right? It says, Our whole universe was in a hot dense state. So conservation of energy means all the energy and the matter in the universe has always existed. It was just 13.8 billion years ago, it was condensed into an infinitely dense and infinitely small point until the universe started expanding and by expanding it could then cool so much so that the particles that would eventually go on to form atoms could chill out enough and stop buzzing around and cool down enough to be bound together into atoms and matter as we know it could form. So I think it's gotta be was hot before it mattered, right? So as much as I appreciate the sentiment, minus points for scientific accuracy. All right, next up. Night sky on a normal day, but on any astronomical event, it's cloudy. I think we've had this one before, but never has a sentiment been truer than in the UK in January. Like we've got the close approach of Venus and Saturn all the way through January, and I keep trying to spot them getting closer and closer, and it always seems to be cloudy. Although it is clear now, so, Fingers crossed. <laughs> if you wanna know more about what you can hopefully spot in January if the weather is kind, check out my Night Sky News episode from a few weeks ago. And of course, look out for January's Night Sky News episode, which is coming out on my channel next week, which will have what to look out for in the night sky towards the end of January and into February. And I'll also be explaining the recent study that has claimed that dark energy doesn't exist. I went offline for two weeks over Christmas and I thought, oh, I'll just have a really nice quiet return to work in January. But nope. <laughs> so I better start reading that and in the meantime if you want to make me laugh then keep sending all of your favourite space memes to me on social media. Now since it is the new year, start of 2025, have you made any new year's resolutions? Because I have and mine is to try and be a bit more productive with my downtime, you know, like try and invest in myself a little bit more. So if you wanna join me in that resolution for 2025, why don't you check out Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant is where you learn by doing, right? It has thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. It's a learning platform that's designed to be uniquely effective. So their first principles approach helps you build understanding from the ground up. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with concepts. A method that's been proven to be six times more effective than just passively watching lectures in videos. For example, maybe you've always wanted to learn how to code. I always advise anybody who wants to get into science to do just that. Well, Brilliant's growing number of programming courses are a great way to build foundations with real world applications. So you can start by getting familiar with Python, just building simple programs on day one with a built in drag and drop editor and slowly but surely train your mind to think like a programmer so that eventually you can start writing complex programs to build games and apps. Learning a little every day like this is one of the most important things you can do and Brilliant helps you build real knowledge in just a few minutes per day. I like to think of Brilliant as pretty much the opposite of mindlessly scrolling on your phone. So if like me, you've made a new year's resolution to just be that little bit more productive and stop mindlessly scrolling and invest in yourself a little bit more, then why don't you try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days. If you visit brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky or scan the QR code on screen, or you can click on that link in the video description and with it, you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thanks so much again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and my channel into 2025 and now roll those bloopers right no hang on for the oh god dropping my phone <laughs>
eight H G G H O G O H O T T O G O. Here she is. This is who you all want to see, isn't it? Not me. <laughs> you just want to see Pip. Come on then. Yeah, get it. <laughs> get it. <laughs> You're going that way to get it. Can you jump up there? Oh my gosh, if you can, I've never. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to have that fight in the comments again, aren't I? Where people are like, why are you pronouncing it meme? It's mem. No, it isn't. It's meme like gene, because that's where the idea of something that replicates very quickly comes from across the internet, right? Meme and gene. It's meme, not mem. I will die on this hill. <laughs>